Hi, I'm Emily Lakdawalla with questions and answers. A listener asked, How come there are sometimes seven days and sometimes eight days between the phases of the moon? Those of you who are well versed in how the sky works may be surprised to hear that most people aren't familiar enough with the sky to know that the moon takes more than four weeks but less than one month to go through its regular cycle of phases. In fact, many people don't even realize that the moon is frequently visible during the day. Our moon takes a little more than 27 days to complete one elliptical orbit around Earth. However, because Earth advances in its own orbit around the Sun during that time, it actually takes two more days for the lunar phases to catch up with Earth's orbital travel. So a full cycle of lunar phases is 29.5 days long, which is a bit longer than four weeks. So if the full moon falls on a Monday, the next full moon will fall on a Wednesday or Thursday. But since 29.5 days is shorter than almost every month, each full moon usually falls one or two calendar days earlier than the full moon on the previous month. Once in a blue moon, there are two full moons per month. In fact, that's the definition of a blue moon. So blue moons always fall on the 30th or 31st day of a month. The full cycle of lunar phases actually measures one full lunar day from sunrise to sunrise. So for any point on the moon, the sun is above the horizon for nearly 15 days and below it for the next 15, meaning that the diurnal temperature range is 300 degrees Celsius. You'd better have good heating and air conditioning if you plan to live on the moon. Got a question about the universe? Send it to us at planetaryradio at planetary.org. And now here's Matt with more Planetary Radio. Time for What's Up on Planetary Radio. Bruce Betts is the Director of Projects for the Planetary Society. He's here to tell us about the night sky and uh, talk about other things. Welcome. Thank you very much. i uh, I, I got to tell one more story about uh, Nilton uh, Reno, our, our guest today. We kept talking a little bit after I stopped recording, and I asked him more about the reaction he's gotten to this. And he said that he, he's from Brazil, and I guess he was doing an interview with uh, some reporter or host in Brazil, and the person broke down. It was in tears, you know, thanking him for this uh, this wonderful discovery, mm-hmm. even, even though not everybody is in full agreement with these results yet. It's true. The way the, uh, the cautious scientific community works, uh, there's still cautious scientific skepticism, but it certainly is a, a tantalizingly uh, interesting result. Maybe it's actually uh, tears. I mean, that's just salty water. <laughs> Marching maybe, tears. Maybe all this is related. <laughs> well, maybe maybe Phoenix landed on somebody, hurt their foot, and now they were crying. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe that was it. How about the night sky? Well, you can see Mars if you want to. If you get up in the pre-dawn and look over in the east, very low down, there'll be this reddish dot. That's Mars. It's still a little tough, but it's pretty visible. Much easier is if you just look up a little bit in the east, and the extremely bright star-like object is Jupiter. Uh, You also might catch low down Venus, which is going to keep getting higher. All of these objects are going to get higher up over the coming days and weeks, but Venus, even brighter object, very low. In the evening sky, we've got Saturn. Saturn up by the time the sun sets in the east, high in the sky in the evening, and it is in Leo. And I encourage you to get your little star chart out. And if you haven't mapped Leo, it's one of the one of the few constellations I can almost buy that I can connect the dots and see a lion. Uh, <laughs> and in this case, you can also see Saturn as some type of, I don't know, firefly flying around the lion. Anyway, check them out if you've got a small telescope. Check out Saturn. Rings nearly at John right at this moment. On to this week in space history. 1973, Pioneer 11 was launched. Pioneer 11, with its uh, sister craft, headed out towards uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn, and then uh, headed off and uh, leaving the solar system. And still going. And uh, I don't know what's happening with the anomaly, but I guess that's something that the society's still working on, right? Anomaly. It is. It is indeed. We are uh, still supporting the work of uh, Slava Turashev and uh, John Anderson and others. Figuring out this uh, gradual, the fact that Pioneer 10 and 11 are slowing down a little tiny bit more than we expect them to be. Hmm. They're getting close. They've saved a a lot of data, a lot of 
da- old data on tapes. Been doing a lot of thermal modeling, and hopefully in the next few months we'll have some some good, interesting results to share. Good, good. We'll look forward to that. On to random space fact. Now there's a departure. That there's I something we needed something different. Yeah, you haven't done anything like that ever in six and a half years. Uh, <laughs> give it to us again, second take. Random space fact. <laughs> Okay, now we can move on. Last week, mere mere days ago, there were 13 people in orbit. 13. Oh, my. Seven on the shuttle, uh, or the shuttle crew, three on the space station, and three headed to the space station on a Soyuz. Uh, this, this feat has only been matched once before in 1995 uh, with a similar configuration, but the space station was Mir, not the International Space Station. That's wonderful. Thank you. That makes me feel good about about us, humanity that is. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. That's that's really what I what I strive for. Let us go on to the trivia question, shall we? We asked you, who was the first person to get married in space? That person in space, their spouse on on the earth. How'd we do? This is so interesting. We got lots of correct answers. Uh, you can find anything nowadays on the web, of course. Uh, but a couple of people said Richard Branson, Mr. Virgin Galactic, and Virgin fill in the blank. Uh, no, he's never been to space, at least not yet. It may not be long. The real answer came to us from many people, but uh, the one who Random.org determined to be this week's winner is Russ Black. Russ Black, a first-time winner, I believe, in Shoreline, Washington, up there in the northwest of the United States. Uh, and uh, he said... It was Yuri Malachenko, Yuri Malachenko, who was apparently the commander of ISS uh, Mission 7. And uh, do you know who he married? He married Ekaterina Dmitrieva. Yeah, and she was in Texas, and he was in New Zealand. (laughs) Well, he was over New Zealand. True, true enough. Russ wonders if maybe there was a distance record there as well for uh, <laughs> furthest apart during nuptials. Uh, it's possible. <laughs> at, at, at least in terms of physical distance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, this was in 2003. So let's uh, go to a, a completely different direction. And now for something completely different. The space shuttle Enterprise was used only for glide tests early in the uh, the, the shuttle program before the space launches of uh, the other shuttles. What noticeable item did it use during its first glide tests, but not later ones? Go to planetary.org slash radio to get us your answer. I I know one because I was there for some of these approach and landing tests, but mum's the word. You are so cool, (laughs) and it was not your mum. You've got till April 6th, Monday, April 6th, at 2 p.m. Pacific time to get us the answer to this latest space trivia question. And you'll win a T-shirt, and I think uh, people were ready for T-shirts again because, boy, uh, the, uh, the, the, the number of question... Uh, question answerers is way up again, so uh, we're, we're, we're sending them out while they're hot. All right, everybody, go out there, look up the night sky, and think about Kurds and Way. Thank you, and good night. No way, man. He's Bruce Betts, <laughs> <laughs> the director of projects for the Planetary Society. He joins us every week here for What's Up. Join us next time as we learn about the next generation spacesuit that will take American astronauts back to the moon. Planetary Radio is produced by the Planetary Society in Pasadena, California. Have a great week. Thank you.